Anthony, I love innovative hotel companies that have got a great collection of brands, and we're going to learn all about that today. With Ethan. Can you just walk backwards and jump in the pool? Go. All right, here we go. Well, I'm Anthony. Welcome to No Vacancy Lives. That's my friend Glenn. You're watching the number one show in hospitality. All right, all right. Hey, everybody. I am so excited to be here with you today. Of course, we've got Anthony Melchiori right there. Uh, and how's been? How are you doing today, man? I'm doing good. I went down to the beach this morning uh -huh. after a nice, uh, nice little training session. And I said, you know what? I had some stuff to do in my office, but I said, right. This is one of the most beautiful fall days, and these days are going to be gone very soon. It's going to get really cold. And I sat at the beach just for about 10 minutes mm -hmm. and was just like, oh, I felt so good. So I need a little beach in my soul this morning. I love it. I'm wishing I was in Miami in this pool over oh, here. Oh, you're not in Miami at the pool? I thought you fell in. No. I'm, I Well, I managed to pull my way out. You know, right. uh, yeah. At special effects, I am soaking wet, but because of the magic of the internet, I'm able to look uh, dry and put together. Now, uh, Anthony, I'm excited because, you know, it's Thursday. We've had a great week of shows so far this week. And I was really excited yesterday because we had on Adele Ross, for example, from Hotel Effectiveness. And we partnered on this great labor study. And if you all want to get a free copy of that, go to hoteleffectiveness.com slash 2020. It's very helpful. Very, right? very, 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 very helpful. And, uh, you know, we co-branded that. Um, a lot of the interviews that we have done, all of those quotes are incorporated into this. There's great advice and a free toolkit to help you be more successful with how you book labor in 2022. But, uh, Anthony, I'm super excited because you remember a few weeks ago, we had on uh, Heather McCrory, and she's the head of a core uh, North America the CEO. She's a great person. But we're going a little bit deeper, going to, like a little bit of a core adjacent today because a core just recently completed a joint venture with Ennis Moore. And it's uh, it's really cool because they've got a portfolio of 14 amazing global brands. And you know them, Anthony. 21C Museum Hotels, 25 Hours, Delano, Hyde, Mondrian, Morgan's Originals, SLS, Hoxton Tribe. I could go on and on, but we don't have that much time. So uh, I'm pretty excited about uh, what we're going to learn about today. Yeah, I can't, I can't wait to, to hear it. And those are great brands that are real brands that are real, you know, uh, they did it the right way, and that's why they've been doing it for so long. Uh, the original Morgan's Hotel was the original boutique hotel. Yeah. Uh, speaking of the boutique hotels and stuff like that, before we bring in our awesome guest, um, what, what's going on? The old Parker Meridian is turning into a Thompson Hotel in New York City? Yeah. So uh, the Thompson Hotel is a um, – what, what, what franchise is that? Is that a Hilton? I don't remember who they're yeah, at. Who they're look at. it up. Glenn, you're, you're the one who's supposed to be the expert. I know. But yeah, I but know. the Parker is now a Thompson Hotel, and which is very interesting. Hyatt. 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 Sorry. So it, it's Hyatt's new kind of higher-end hotel. And um, it has the other Thompsons, I believe, are Thompson by Hyatt. Mm -hmm. This one stands alone, but it's a Hyatt, uh, you know, the systems behind it. And um, it's very interesting because the Parker – was a very um, influential hotel on 57th Street for a long, long time and uh, was very significant. And uh, the Thompson, I mean, it has a wonderful opportunity, a wonderful location to really rebrand that hotel and really make it something that hasn't been in, in, in several years. Anthony, I'm all up for updates, but what about the burger joint? What about... Yeah. Uh, you know what? The burger joint is called Burger Joint. Right. And for those who don't know, there's this beautiful hotel and you walk in, there's this red uh, drapery in the middle of the lobby. You're like, what's that? And then there's this long line of people that look like everybody from tourists to kids from Brooklyn to, you know, billionaires that live on West 57th Street all waiting to go in this shit kicker hamburger place with sawdust on the floor, paper bags. For these great hamburgers. So I I would imagine that's gone, but I could be 100% wrong. I hope you're 100% wrong about that. But we it's all a good burger, too. It's a good burger. And Benny, uh, and speaking of uh, great burgers uh, there, I made uh, I made great bacon cheeseburgers last night on the call. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Mm -hmm. Also, um, the, the whole $10,000 martini on the rock that got me to really into marketing and thinking about marketing and how right. marketing and PR can really change the trajectory of a hotel. Mm -hmm. Norma's had the, if you remember the thousand uh, dollar omelet or something. Right. Uh, frittata. 
And uh, I, it was on the front page of Daily News. And I turned to Carla from my PR company. And I said, see that? If I don't get the front page of the newspaper, you're done. And about a year later, we got the front page of the newspaper. Beautiful. <laughs> I, I love it. Well, listen, PR and marketing and creating a whole vibe is so essential to being able to explain to a customer or a potential customer what that experience is going to be like. Right. And also understanding, we really should have some PR experts. My PR person should be coming on, Rebecca, and really talk the difference between, uh, which she's on before, uh, talk about marketing and PR. Mm -hmm. Marketing is a long-term strategy that costs money. PR is you can do a one-hit wonder and relaunch your entire hotel, which we right. did uh, at the Algonquin. That one brand, relaunch, that one campaign relaunched our entire brand. That's pretty cool. And you know, what's really cool is that all of that can come together in the right way. And that's what Ennis Moore does well. So I want to welcome to the show, Phil Zrian, brand CEO and head of Americas with Ennis Moore with all those great brands we were just talking about. Phil, so great to see you. Thanks so much. And welcome to the show. Good to see you guys. How's it going? Good. It's good to be seen. So where are you? You're, you're uh, in Miami? I'm in New York. I'm in, I know. I'm in New York, York enjoying the uh, 75 degree weather in the middle of October, which so is then you live. Do you live in New York? I live in Tribeca, yeah. You live in Tribeca. So, for those people that kind of are still poo pooing on New York and saying it's not back and all that, what is, what is it like right now in Tribeca? It's pretty close to normal. In all honesty, it's pretty close to normal. You walk the streets and everybody's being respectful and wearing masks as appropriate when you go into uh, to restaurants before you show your vaccine card. But in terms of in the streets and the busyness and it's pretty close to normal. Now, I will say that when you go more midtown, which is more bustly, it's a little less than it might it's have been. But the, but the trend is moving upwards clearly. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. So the those who projected the demise of New York, I think, are you know a little a little off. Um, um, it's kind of right back to normal. Yeah, pretty well, much. Listen, the most powerful city in the world. Uh, it's you know I'm not saying it can't it, it can't shut down one day, but um, I, it's not today. And it's uh, it's great because Tribeca is actually, I think, the first neighborhood in New York that came back. I think they really, uh, a lot of people didn't leave the restaurants. Uh, I think they support their local restaurants. What do people down in Tribeca think about these now extensions of restaurants that are on the sidewalks? I know a lot of them look like, you know, they really need a paint job. But um, do you think it's good for the neighborhood? Do you think it's bad for the neighborhood? Do you think they'll go away? I was going to say, it's actually, I think it's great. It almost turns... Tribeca and other boroughs into a European feeling vibe. And it's just so pleasant, especially when the weather is nice to go out, be able to sit outside. It's made it's a big, big difference um, during the, 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 the pandemic. And now it's just adding, and I don't think it's ever going to go away. I think everybody's lobbying to have it stay and we're all for it. It makes a big, yeah. big difference. And I do agree. Some of them need paint jobs, but for me, it's more of a bit of a kind of, charismatic type of vibe offering a neighborhood. So I think it's a good thing. Yeah, I love it. And some of them done great jobs, five-star little uh, sheds. And um, I can't imagine on a night like tonight walking in a restaurant and they say inside or outside and you say inside. I mean, right. especially New Yorkers who are used to the seasons, you know the cold weather's coming. So you know there's a few more days left and then we're, we're all going inside. Uh, every single day that it's beautiful out like it is right now is amazing. After As soon as we're off air today, I'm going for a hike in the woods because that's going to be uh, great. But you're in the city, and you've got some of your hotels there. How are, how are you guys feeling about how it's all coming together again for you, since you have a lot of properties in, in urban locations, but obviously you have some in, uh, in other places too, like the 21C hotels, which are more secondary and tertiary markets? Yeah. We're, we're, we're obviously a very global uh, company, and the recovery is happening systematically. It's um, different markets are showing a different stage of evolution. Clearly, for example, Miami is insanely uh, strong. It's been strong throughout the whole pandemic. Um, and it's just the most impressive market and the hotels are performing better than they ever have in the history of, of our hotels in Miami. Um, the Middle East also very, very strong. The Middle East was seen as kind of a refuge during the pandemic and it continued that way. Mm -hmm. And then pockets of, of Europe generally are coming back, but a little more slowly. Although we see some good trends in Paris, good trends in London, but it's a little more challenging, but we're on the upswing. Um, that's, that's great. 
Yeah. So I how mean, do you take how do you take hotels like a Delano or a Morgan's and hotels have been around a long time, basically set the trend, invented invented and created the trend, and keep it um, fresh because the person that was cool and trendy when Morgan's first opened is now a grandfather. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Oh my God, that's so true. It's so true. <laughs> yes. No, it's a really good question. It's a very good question. And the thing about lifestyle hotels, and everybody uses the word, it's fairly ubiquitous. And Which I hate, by the way. I hate lifestyle word. boutique, however you want to call it. When it comes down to it, for me, and being very simplistic, it's a, it's a place where you want to go and feel like you're in the middle of something. You kind of feel cool. It doesn't matter if you're 84. It doesn't matter if you're 24. You just feel a certain vibe and to your point you absolutely as an operator of these hotels have to continue evolving to can to make that um be perpetuated and that means being in tune with what the guests are looking for what would you and say I'm, is the biggest change from then to now i think honestly the, the, the for me the two biggest changes is although you know food and beverage was always a key part of the experience it's even more now um it's less about the celebrity chefs. It's more about the overall experience, what you feel when you go in, obviously great food, but it's not just, I'm gonna be seated and have a good meal. It's what what's my entertainment? What am I seeing around me? How's the, the music? How's the lighting? People expect a certain type of atmosphere in a lifestyle hotel that is maybe right. not typical in a conventional hotel. Yeah. The other major change that we're seeing is 20 years ago, if you were, um, uh, a lifestyle customer. You would go to the hotel, you would plan on having dinner, going out till the wee hours in the morning, coming back, going to the beach and doing it all over again. Right. Now, as we know, fitness is taking on and wellness take on a whole different place in our society. And people want to, to have that kind of healthy life balance in addition to I'm going out to have a good time. So being able to allow them to have that balance when they're traveling and to do what they want to do, but still be able to feel fairly healthy, even though they're on vacation is a total shift from what it was just a few years ago. Are they asking how many calories is in my martini? Not that, not that <laughs> much, <laughs> but um, you know, it's just, where can I, where can I find the gym? Where can I get a personal training session? Um, do you have uh, low calorie meals? Where can I find the smoothie? It's just right. all about their, underlying overall health mixed with having a good time and it's just not unilateral I mean, of course health, have you. So. a healthy lifestyle was trendy 20 years ago now a healthy lifestyle like most people are trying to live a healthier lifestyle i was just with a friend of mine that lost 40 pounds and he's trying to live a healthier oh. lifestyle i have a question for you that i haven't really thought about or asked before mm -hmm. and do you and Glenn, maybe you can add to this because um, I don't know. You're, you're a foodie and you know you go to all these nice hotels you're a fancy guy do you think the celebrity chef trend that you talked about, do you think it's kind of slowing down because there have been so many celebrity chef restaurants that just didn't hit the mark? The answer is yes. And I think it's also the definition of celebrity. You know, I always found it, found it very strange that when someone was publicizing their so-called celebrity chef, they would have to have the name of the chef and then describe below why the chef was a celebrity. In other words, you know, famous from this. And my view was, if you have to explain why he or she is a celebrity, maybe they're not a celebrity. Or right. maybe they're not big enough to draw a, a, right. a, 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 enough of crowd for, for a restaurant. I, I agreed. And it kind of goes back to the overall societal view of, you know, famous for being famous versus actually famous for something tangible. So for me, the best qualifier for a celebrity chef is someone who delivers amazing food Mm -hmm. and who has done it more than once. And I think that right. will continue, but I don't think you need the reliance on a brand name in order to be successful because people are getting more and more adventurous about saying, where can I discover the next great meal mm -hmm. and worry less about having a cookie cutter experience from one right. you know chef over and over again. That is absolutely right, Phil. Um, and I want to add a layer on top of that, which I think gets to uh, what um, my, my point of view is. Celebrity chefs were really essential before people got really great about food and understanding what the potential was of food. So when we moved from a lot of processed foods and all of that kind of stuff to 
going out and dining being a more central part of our lives, we needed those celebrity chefs, and particularly in the early day of cable, to help us negotiate and navigate the emerging food scene, to really understand what it's going on. Now, us, we've been through that for 30 plus years at this point. Future, you know, millennials and Gen Z, they've grown up with that. Now they're ready to engage in food and beverage in a different way. And Phil, I think that goes exactly back to what you were saying, where you had of all of that, but more, because everyone's been there and done that. And now you've got to keep pushing the edges, pushing those boundaries. And you don't necessarily need somebody who's supposedly a big name to lead you down in that direction. Totally. I was like, if I compare my kids and their uh, food right. tastes and their food knowledge and That's what right. they look for and aspire to be part of versus me growing up, it's I mean, it's a whole different it's a whole different universe. Were you were you a Whopper or a Big Mac guy? I was a hundred percent a Big Mac guy. You know, but honestly, when we were growing up, that was it, man. Whatever your mom made whatever your family made. And then when you would go out and you'd have a Big Mac, Big Mac. Like, McDonald's was like not seen as what it is today. No, not much I'll really have a Big Mac, but like you grew up eating Big Macs. Big Macs. You know, it's funny. I tell my kids this. I haven't had a Big Mac in probably 20 years. Right. But I had so many Big Macs growing up <laughs> that, that I can, I can, I can actually <laughs> feel exactly what it tastes like to this day. Because, right, you know, and if you same thing with a quarter pounder, or but you're right, right because it was viewed as a treat. You didn't really think about the health concerns when you were 13 right. or 14 years old, and now you know I just wouldn't really suggest that my kids have Big Macs on a regular basis. Wait, I mean, are you saying happy. Frosted Flakes wasn't a healthy choice? Yeah. <laughs> right, uh, 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 that's offensive because it is definitely the healthy choice I choose to make. But, uh, but you know, Phil, I think it's important for everyone to know. Ennis Moore also has a, a big uh, restaurant division. I think there's over 150 restaurants globally uh, as well that are part of it. So you guys know your food and you know how to bring those two elements together in ways that a lot of traditional hotel companies haven't quite yet figured out. So what is the secret right now to getting people engaged and really want to come back time and time again when it comes to combining hospitality with the hotel and the food and beverage and the overall experience that people are so craving these days. Listen, for us, um, an inherent part of lifestyle, as we discussed, is food and beverage, which means that as a hotel operator, we need to also control the food and beverage experience. Mm -hmm. We're not big fans of completely outsourcing that experience to a third party because we think it's an integral part of the overall vibe of the hotel so that's that's number one which is controlling the brands controlling the experience and making it part of the overall hotel feel when you walk in um, back to what we were saying earlier you have to start with high-end chefs who can deliver a quality meal a quality right. product and you have to make it approachable nobody wants to go in a hotel stay for five or six days and have a, such, such a distinct unique meal that they can only do it once during that stay so it's a balance of finding enough options in the hotel where you feel I can experiment, I can have my 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 um, you know piece of trying to find out new things and and be a little more adventuresome, but also go back for the usual meal that I want to have on a re repeat basis. That's number one. The other piece I think is making the food and beverage um, offering appealing to the customer beyond who is the one who's staying in the hotel, which means making it appealing to the city or urban center or wherever you are and having outside guests come in because if you are a hotel guest you don't want to be surrounded only by people who are staying in the hotel you right. want to feel like you are part of a hub um, that is central to the city you're in and that's part of marketing social media and having the proper activations to attract uh, a broader clientele Something that 21C has done exceptionally well by by combining great food and beverage with that art element, not only does it become a distinct part of the neighborhood, but it helps bring in larger groups of people as well, I would think. You know, I was at a 21C in Louisville just uh, 10 days ago and went down to the restaurant, get your pre-dinner drink, and you just walk around the hotel slash museum, which is what 21C is, is all about, mm -hmm. and have an amazing experience and then go sit down and have a meal. So exact, you know, exactly right, that fully integrated uh, experience within the hotel is exactly what we are going for. 21C is a perfect example because it's right there with the museum feel. Mm -hmm. It's like you're being curated too on so many different levels. 
Uh, that's exactly what we, what we strive for. So how do you strike that balance then between approachable, but exciting, an electric type of food that gets people to want to experiment? Because I, I know the problem you're dealing with is everybody says they want, 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 but then they want to get in the, the burger at the mm -hmm. end of the day, right? So where is the magic in between? The magic is in having the right staff on the ground mm -hmm. who are able to convey the experience we're trying to get across. Uh, it's actually very difficult these days because of the pandemic and labor markets and training and all right. the issues that we have. But for us, the biggest secret sauce that we have as a company is being able to attract the right people. People always ask me, you know, what's your special ingredient? How do you guys make it work? And it's not like we have a bench of a hundred, you know, staff, waiters, whatever you want to call it. Right. We can only, we're only as good as who we can recruit. And we recruit by having a common philosophy that says we're all here trying to purvey this certain lifestyle in our hotels. We want it to be fun. We want it to be not over the top in terms of stuffiness. And the staff are the first point of contact with the customer. And their job is to ensure that they are pushing, probing the right buttons to allow for the adventure type, the allow for the one who doesn't want it, you know, or in between. So right. it's for us, it's really having the right people on the ground who feel like they have the the, um, the support to deliver the right experience. You know, it's it's less is more, right? Especially with lifestyle hotels. And the reason I don't like the name lifestyle hotels, because I think whether you're 60 or 20, you know, when you say lifestyle, people that are 60 don't feel like, wow, I may be part of that lifestyle. But like, if you look at the screen behind, or actually you're at the pool, right, Glenn? Yes. Uh, you look at that cabana, <laughs> right? And you've seen a lot of cabanas over the years. And that to me, yes, it looks luxurious, but it's, it's what I want. It's a right. comfortable bed. Right. It's some good lighting. It's a TV. And there's so many of these cabanas that have these ridiculously shaped, you know, beds that are not comfortable. The lighting is terrible. The cabanas are falling down. They're stained and less is more. And I think in industry, I learned that, you know, for the last 30 something years is that strip it away. And then put it back because when you strip it away, 80% of it isn't coming back. Same thing when you plate food. Like last night, I was at a, at a restaurant where the former Il Molino chef was, is, is the chef. And again, you said, you know, a high end chef. Yeah, he's a high end chef, but he doesn't act like a high end chef. And I think that's another problem, right? So, but, but when he plates, you know, and he's a big guy from Italy with a heavy accent and he looks like a chef that's like kind of intense. But you would have thought a ballerina that's 99 pounds plates his food because it is so soft. It is so light the way the plating is done. And to me, that the, the food, he lets the food speak for itself and it's a very light hand. And to me, that is something that is almost a lost art. Because yeah. everybody's trying to put more and trying to do more and trying to do more with ingredients and trying to blow your brains out as opposed to getting a good mozzarella or good prosciutto or good whatever and putting it in its pure form and letting you experience it. Totally agree. And it goes back to my point of, especially in a hotel setting, being able to offer a, a customer a meal that they will come back and enjoy and not feel like it's so out there or is so worthy of need of interpretation that I just right. do not want to go through that again. It's too heavy. So that balance is, is crucial. And I think your point on simplicity transcends food and beverage is just across the board. You know, the amount of times that we've walked into um, a model room for a hotel mm -hmm. that has been kind of over designed in an effort to push the envelope, you've just completely lost any sense of functionality. Right. And sometimes you just have to say, okay, well, what am I here for? I'm actually here for an, a proper night's day. I'm here for an enjoyable experience in the coffee shop. I'm here for a, a meal. I'm not here to be completely, um, you know, wowed 24 hours on 24 hours. There has to be that balance. And that's, you know, that's, that's an art. That's not a science. And, and right. that, that, that ties into us working with designers who know us well, a lot of experience with Philippe Stark, for example, is, is one that we've worked a ton with who understands exactly that, you know, that, that fine line between, being at the forefront, but not right. so far in front that nobody's getting what you're trying to sell. 
Right. And, and, you know, what I always say about design, first of all, uh, to go back to your statement about a model room being over-designed. Really? Model rooms are over-designed? <laughs> I don't think there's ever been a model room that wasn't over-designed. Um, it's like, you know how many times I've been in the model room and I'm pulling out furniture in the middle of the hallway and the people are climbing in, coming into the room, and they're like, what's going on? I'm like, there's way too much furniture in here. And, you know, to me, and I've said this, you know, in any hotel that I, 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 I had, I say the first thing I want to hear from an employee or a guest when they see the model room is wow. I want to hear wow, because wow to me tells me you can't really explain what you're seeing because it just all works. When you go in, you go, oh, this is nice or this is pretty. Then the one thing is taking you away to that corner of the room or that one wall is taking you away as opposed to opening the door and going, wow, you're being overwhelmed in a good way. And a lot of times, very simple way. I remember there was a hotel, uh, the Western Hotel, and I can't remember the gentleman's name, very famous designer. It was so simple. It was it was just like different shades of blue. It was like one of the most simple model rooms I've ever had. And when I found out how much he charged for that, I was like, he charged for that? That much money? But again, <laughs> he's, so, he's so well known and so, um, you know, he has so much confidence that he can present that, whereas a younger designer would never present that because it's so simple. Totally. I mean, listen, what I want in a room is I want the ability to control the lights, which is very difficult in a lot of rooms. And I want the ability to plug in my phone close to my bed. That's right. That's what I want. Right. And it's crazy how many times you can, you don't have either of those two things. But no, I mean, you're absolutely right. Um, the ability for someone to come in and say, I like this room. I can't tell you exactly why I like this room, but it feels right and it's not prescribed. I, mean, I go back to the original Delano in Miami, you know, which it was it was so simple in terms of it was all white, there right. were curtains, there were lots of open spaces. And it's remarkable how many people kind of have this sense of at the time you felt lucky to mm -hmm. be allowed to go into the hotel just because of the way it was designed. Right. Um, and you know, that that really was the start of the whole lifestyle movement. Um, sure. But that's been the attempt is to replicate that over and over again. It's not easy. So, Phil, uh, you know, uh, people, uh, people, not you necessarily, or your company have a tendency to continue to plus, plus, plus stuff, add more to it, which I think creates some of that psychological clutter, if not the actual physical clutter at certain properties. How do you not fall into that trap, number one? And number two, how has perhaps what we've been experiencing for the last 18 months or so helped you start to maybe strip away things in the design package to, to help create something that's more uh, approachable again, like those initial hotels? Yeah, I mean, it's a combination of many different factors. Uh, clearly, mm -hmm. as hotel operators, we deal with our partners who are the owners of the hotels. Right. And, you know, they come to the table with a with a view, clearly, but they also come with an understanding that they would like to get our perspective on what we think works for whatever property they're looking to build or convert. And for us, you know, we have a team that's been around um, with us for a long, long time on the design side, construction side, mm -hmm. and has the benefit of a long experience of how the space has, has evolved, what our brands mean in the marketplace, and staying true to that, and and taking the owners through the process to just to, to not overdo, to not um, take it to the nth degree, but to maintain that balance of functionality and, and, and design. I think what the pandemic has also done is it's made everybody kind of step back a little bit, get some perspective around what's important to them. You know, during the, the heyday of the, of the pandemic, I would go to Miami to look at the hotel, we'd have guests and it was a different, a different type of guest. The expectations were there, but not the impatience, not the 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 need right. for for the small things. It was more. I'm just happy to be traveling. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be enjoying and experiencing. Mm -hmm. and we had to adapt. You just have the doors open. That you just have the doors open, and they're they're kissing your feet. It, it, you know, and you know, I don't. That's not going to continue. But no, it's, not, it's not. We talked about yesterday how that's over. <laughs> it's, only, it's one of the silver linings, if they're if really we can call it that, of the pandemic is everybody in in all facets of their life step back, got some perspective. Right. What's important? What's less important? And it translated into everything. So even as as leaders of a company, 
and being understanding of employees and the things that they were dealing with. And it just, it transcends the whole, the whole day-to-day mantra. So I think that hopefully, hopefully some of that will continue as we move forward right. to make it, you know, a much more pleasant, um, you know, experience for everyone. Yeah. I, I've, uh, I've become a lot more patient and a lot less patient on some things. I'm so much more patient with people. I'm, you know, I'm probably less patient. Um, but there's some people I'm more patient with. It depends on, on whereas before I was kind of like just impatient all the time. Uh, but it really has changed things, but your brands are very iconic. However, there are so many big brands out there that have systems and reward members that are, you know, in what, where's Marriott have now 600 trillion? I, I think something <laughs> like that. It might be 601 trillion. Yeah. yeah. So, so they have 601 trillion members. How as an owner, I come to you and I say, Hey, Phil, right. I love your hotels. I love your vibe. I love what you do, but you just don't bring what these other management companies, <laughs> these other brands bring. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, convince me why I should love you, Phil. I mean, listen, that's a very good question. And one, so my background, I, do is it I was, day. With, <laughs> I was oh, with yeah. SBE, predecessor to Ennismore. And um, SBE acquired Morgan's Hotel Group in 2016. Um, so in addition to the SLS and the high that SBE had, we acquired Mondrian, Delano, the brands that, you know, obviously are I- iconic in nature. And the, the goal clearly was to have the brands sell themselves for the reason right. you mentioned, they are what they are and people want to be part of them. And you, you get a certain amount of, of, of benefit from that. But, but um, as owners have evolved, as the world has evolved and the world's becoming smaller, mm-hmm. distribution, procurement, um, IT, all the, the loyalty programs, all of the benefits that people tend to expect from their hotel companies become more and more important. So to your, to your point, in 2018, we started having conversations with bigger brands who were also looking to get into the lifestyle space to understand how we could partner to try to provide the best of all worlds. And clearly we weren't the, we weren't the first. It's, it's been attempted many times. It's failed many times because the holy grail is to combine those two, but not lose the uniqueness and the DNA of the brands that you are trying to bring to the market or are, have in the market. We ended up doing a deal with the core and now we're, we created Ennismore. And the goal, exactly as you say it, is to effectively have the client facing piece of the equation be completely lifestyle and be um, exactly what the customer is looking for behind the scenes to get the benefits of the global brand that I mentioned earlier. So to answer your question, when we talk to owners, that is exactly what we sell. We tell them you are getting the best of everything with us. We've seen the mistakes that other large brands have made in trying to integrate independent companies. And we do not want to do that. In fact, our organization is set up to avoid doing that because of the mishaps of prior deals. Um, so, you know, it's it's a work in progress, but it, it is definitely the ambition. Yeah, yeah to I, repurpose a cliche, Anthony, it sounds like this is soft branding on steroids, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, and you know, what I find is when these big brands buy, you know, um, other hotels that are either five-star or branded uh, brands, uh, uh, lifestyle brands, and they come in, is they take a guy that ran a big box hotel in New York. And I'm not saying, because I was a big, you know, I, I, was a, I wasn't a lifestyle hotel guy, but I am a lifestyle hotel guy because I think I can run any hotel. But, but you, because I have a young creative mind, but you take these kids or these guys or these old people, whatever you want to call them, and they come in from these big boxes with this branded philosophy and mindset. And then you put them in the Mondrian, you put them, listen, a hotel is a hotel is a hotel. But you got to show up with the flavor. You got to show up with that understanding and and thinking out of the box. And the biggest problem with these big brands that then took over these five star hotels, and we all know who they are, that they weren't able to maintain it to the level that their original originators started was simply because they were handed a manual. And then they they're like, now what do I do? It's like there's not a manual for a five star guest that's paying fifteen thousand dollars a night for a hotel room 
or ten thousand dollars. There's no manual. It's like they want you to, you know, bring the horse through the lobby. You bring the horse through the lobby. You don't call Mr. You know, Mr. Vice President and say, "Can I bring the horse through the lobby?" Say, "Yeah, bring the goat too." And I think that that's really been the stagnation in that switchover. Is the mentality they didn't grow up without a book, and when you ask them to think, they have a tough time thinking. It's so so true, and and I think what's important to note is that nobody is, um, you know, poorly intentioned when this happens. They don't want to commoditize a brand. They don't want, but it That's just right. is what they, they're what they know. Funny story: when we first did our deal with Accor, Sebastian Bazan, the CEO of Accor, came to me and said, "We are going to involuntarily try." to commoditize your brands. Do not let us do that. Do not let us do that. And that stuck with me. And the core really, I think, got it right in terms of investing in several different brands, 21 CSB and others, and saying, we're going to start by only buying a portion of the brands. We're going to let them do their thing on their own. They're going to come to us as they need help, but we are not going to get in their way. And eventually we will see what we can do. And I think that philosophy has played out right because it has, you know, avoided the pitfalls that you just mentioned, which just just happen because it's there's a playbook. You apply the playbook and next thing you know, you're one. I, one I, I love experience. the way you said that. I love the way you said that people don't they're, they're, they're not ill intention. And I also love the fact that one little bullet statement of don't let us basically screw up the brand. Right. Don't let us take control. That moment is literally worth a four-year degree in leadership because I could see your face when you said it that not only it inspired you, you you wanted to work harder with them. You wanted to make sure and it also gives you license that where you're in those hard meetings and you're saying, hey, you know, this guy's just not getting it, that you can go in and say, listen, sit over there. We got this. And you, cause you know, the guy that said that to you is going to back you up. 100%. And, I, and I think that is so critical to young people coming into this business. Those few words change the change, change the people's people's career. I remember Dave Johnson on Miller global told me, he said, don't ask for forgiveness. Ask for, don't ask for permission. Ask for forgiveness. Changed my entire <laughs> mindset for how I run hotels, literally changed everything for me. And everybody around me, like, is that standard now? If you don't have that standard when you work with me, then you can't be, I can't work with you. I just can't, I can't develop your hotel. I can't run your hotels. I can't be your partner because that is true to me, true leadership. And people like us, we don't need a lot of direction. You just need to get out of our way and no one's going to be harder on us than us. It's such, I mean, it's crazy how, as you point out, nuggets of, information or bullets or directions that's what you remember when you look back on your career 25 30 years you don't remember the long diatribe speeches you just remember those little tidbits of guidance that kind of stayed with you throughout your whole career and i think it is a a, a lesson in leadership to say what's effective what resonates and how do you let people just do what they need to do as you say get out of their way surround yourself with people that are smarter and able to think on their feet and find solutions because I'm not going to find, I'm, I'm not going to tell you how to run your day to day. That's not, that's not what I do. I remember I walked into a hotel that we were tur- turning around. There was this manual somebody put together and, and I remember somebody teaching the manual. I went up to the front and I took the manual and I said, listen, don't do anything immoral and don't do anything illegal. And I threw the manual in the garbage and I said, just be you. And let's turn this hotel around. And I started hiring managers that understood that. And we literally rewrote the manual after we implemented everything. There's so how many manuals have you have you opened? <laughs> Nobody opens no, manuals. No. I write them after we do them just so the next guy or the next girl can kind of have a little bit of a guidance. But like I don't mind if they fall in the garbage. It's you have to allow people to fail to succeed. And the biggest problem in our business. There are too many vice presidents reporting into too many senior vice presidents that report into too many first vice presidents, and their number one job is not to get fired. Same thing, you know, in, in the TV business. You know, when when you're pitching a show, you know, the person may love it, 
But they're not thinking about, oh, this is great. They're thinking about my boss did not green light these kind of shows before. And I'm not putting my name on this show because I will get fired. And that is the biggest problem, not only in the hospitality business or TV business, in business period. People are afraid to get fired. And you're hitting on something that is very near and dear to my heart, which is to fight the reaction to say no. And right. that is one of the rare you know, benefits. I came from an investment banking background. I was a, a banker for a long time. And because we are always advising clients, we're forced to operate within a certain constraint and find ways to do things within those constraints. When you walk into a corporate environment, that's actually a healthy attitude because you go in there saying, there's a problem. We can spend 10 minutes lamenting the fact that there is a problem, but let's spend the majority of our time trying to find a solution. And too often you get in situations where it's the reverse. It's five hours lamenting the issue and not enough time trying to find a solution. So I agree with you that layers of bureaucracy, it just it, it just adds to no, here's why we cannot do it. Well, let's talk about how why we can do it. And you have to empower people to just figure out solutions. And that's super important in the hospitality space because it's all about the one-on-one -on -one customer experience and not asking if you can satisfy the customer, just satisfying the customer. That's the number one job. Right. That is another one job. And you've got a, a different type of customer. I, I've got a question for you. But first, we've been put on notice, or I've been put on notice. Uh, Steve Belmonte, industry icon, is watching. I'm, we're in big trouble now. we got to watch out. But Phil, I got to ask you, um, speaking of that, uh, that, that balance, what types of ownership groups are investing in your brand names? Is it big institutions? Is it individual operators? What's, what's kind of your sweet spot? So it's, it's interesting you say that back to the comment that Anthony made about grandfathers who are now going to our hotels. Right. We have a lot of investors who are the children or even right. the grandchildren of former institutional investors in hospitality and real estate who grew up with these brands mm. and want to take them to the next level. Um, a lot of international owners who come at it, first time owners like the brand, want to bring this back to their home country. Um, you know, those are our types of owners because we work together to create something that is new. We obviously have our institutional owners, right. they, they, a lot of them get exactly what we're trying to accomplish and they do more than one hotels and that's a big part of our business. But more and more, we are seeing kind of the one off uh, groups who want to build something special in their city, uh, want us to, to educate them and take them right. through the process of running cool. a hotel. Mm -hmm. And for us, that is 100% our sweet spot because- so that's, yeah. that's crazy, Phil, one offs. That's got- it's great that you get them, but that's got to be a complicated process to figure out who these people are and make meaningful connections with them. Or maybe because you've got such iconic brands, they're ringing you up on the phone. How does that process work for uh, folks like you? It goes back a little bit to the benefit of having a platform like a core to deal with that has right. a global network of ah, developers right. who can, you know, who sell aggressively our brands who are, who know our brands. And that, that balance with the, the kind of legwork of, of literally getting out there and talking to people and them coming. And it, sometimes it takes, it takes years to formulate a relationship, right. to have somebody eventually pull the trigger. Yeah. But, but our, best, our best advertisement for selling new hotels is our existing hotels. So we, as long as we're performing with our existing hotels, our view is the deals will come. So what are you doing with the new kind of way people want to work with, especially being in the service industry, being in, you know, schedules. Listen, you got, I love you to work at home, but you really can't serve those eggs, you know, from your, from your bedroom. So what are you doing? And I would imagine you're probably better suited than the bigger hotel companies to really understand the mentality of that gig environment. And yeah. uh, Anthony, they also happen to have co-working environments that they they're creating okay. as well and brands in that vertical. So uh, perfect question. Exactly. I mean, listen, the trend towards co-working started a while ago. The yeah. pandemic took it to a whole new level. I think that even, you know, before the pandemic, co-working had a connotation of, you know, trying to find a to work in a, in a space that had a common area and you could find your work-life balance. But the, there was still always a perception of that separation before between I'm going to a hotel for my vacation time and I'm going to a hotel for my work time. 
Now, actually, and I think this is real time, I think the pandemic has created a dynamic where people are trying to find a way to just combine them because we've done it for the past year and a half working from home and trying to less to separate them and say, how do I make it work? So for us, it's trying to understand how that's going to evolve. We have um, a co-working program, as you say, called Work Now in Chicago and London that we're rolling out. It's very, very uh, popular within Ennismore and how we kind of take it to the next level to make it even more easy and accessible for those who want to combine all parts of their life, i.e. lifestyle, work and you know vacation. That is where kind of where we're headed. You know, I think we got to get out of the head. We talked about this yesterday of working from home and flexibility and lazy are not the same thing. It's, you know, a lot of people, especially older generations, say, well, if they work from home, they're going to be lazy. If they work from home, they're not going to get it done. And I think it's the opposite in the majority of the cases that if you can have more flexibility, you don't want to lose that flexibility. You want you want to maintain that and you want to maintain the respect. And plus, since you don't have so much supervision, that those moments that you have to perform are so much more valuable because those are so much weighted so heavily. Like if I only if I see you around the office every single day and you come in dragging and you, you miss a report, eh, I know who you are. I know what you're about. But if I don't see you and, you know, but once a week and I ask you for a report and the report doesn't show up, I don't really have much to go on. So I think there's a lot more at stake when you give people the flexibility. So I think that it's going to be a major competitive advantage for employers across the board to allow workers that flexibility. Uh, people are used to it. They want it. Even with us within Ennismore, we've already implemented, you know, a formal plan of making it totally accessible to work from wherever you want to work for. Mm -hmm. And I think it ties into the fact that generally in society, everything is more measurable. Productivity yep. is easily measured. So you don't have to be on top of somebody to figure out exactly what they're doing. I mean, clearly right. within a hotel, there are jobs you need to be there, but we're talking right. a little right. differently. Well, you don't have to be in the office to send the fax or you know, use the, use their phone for long distance phone. Would calls. you say send the fax? Yeah, <laughs> I, what I'm I, I specifically said fax and long distance phone calls because oh. we were trapped within the confines of the office environment because of mm -hmm. a lot of the ways the technology. Yeah, right. yeah. What is a fax? I don't know what the fax. Yeah, is. right. Uh, yeah, well, it was something that uh they used to say in drag. I was in the back office of the Plaza Hotel fact. the first time I saw the first time I saw a fax machine. I was at the concierge at the Plaza Hotel as a young manager, and I remember watching the machine going. That came from where, where? That came from Italy? <laughs> that is so cool. It's crazy. <laughs> I thought it was pretty cool when Venetian and Palazzo had one in each and every one of their uh their Yeah, remember they probably still some of them probably, probably still still have it. I know. But um uh it, we're, it, got, we're out of time. I want to get to the last question if that's all right with you. Um we're out of time. Oh, actually I do I have one o'clock. Okay, go ahead. All right. So uh, <laughs> today's uh, last question is once again brought to you by the incredible producer. Dr. Suzanne, her question is, what is your recommendation for creating an inviting workplace culture, especially since you are not a big known label brand, like one of those major companies that just got named third best place to uh, work for? It really touches on everything we've, we've, we've discussed already. For me, it starts with um, empowerment and autonomy and stressing to everyone. And I always say this to people, I say, you know, no matter what role you have in the company, whether you're sitting in a cube or walking around, you have your perspectives, you have your thoughts. And too many times people who are at the junior level or the mid level say to themselves, I'm observing this, I'm seeing this. It doesn't make sense to me, but I guess it's okay because everybody's just going with it. And I'm always saying it's not okay. If you have a view that is different, that is doesn't make sense to you, share it, share it, let's talk about it. And creating that dynamic where that occurs is super, super, super healthy. Listen, there may be a conversation. The answer may be, I disagree, or let's change this, but I don't agree with that. But at least everybody feels like they're contributing to the betterment of the organization versus just doing their job and not having any visibility on where we're going. So for me personally, the key, key piece of the puzzle is to ensure everyone feels engaged and the ability to contribute, not just in their designated lane, but beyond. And that will not only better the workplace, but it's going to better the company because everyone is thinking day to day, how do we improve the overall experience, not just the job that I do? 
So that's my when somebody, two cents worth. When somebody has a creative idea and, and questions the authority, you have to exploit that. Right. Because then everybody believes that Phil is not just talking, but he's walking it. And right. that, to me, I find so valuable that when somebody does do that, maybe a housekeeper or a houseman or whatever, I make sure that I just put that in lights in the sky and say, hey, this person created this. And you know what? We're so excited. We gave them this you know, present trip, money, whatever we did, because it was such a great idea. They weren't afraid because we all have that one, two, three, five people in the in the business that are always knocking on your door, you know, busting chops. But it's that person that does his job every day or does her job every day that's very w w wants to do a good job for the organization that is just like, you know what? I don't want to I don't want to get anybody in trouble. I don't want to upset anyone. I don't want to get anybody mad at me. And I'm just going to be quiet. So the more you do that and the more you ask questions, the more you do walk around management, the more people feel uh, feel really um, comfortable with that. 100 percent. And it also impacts how you recruit, because you recruit people that you think are going to be able to do that, are going to want to do that. Mm -hmm. And then it just perpetuates itself to having the right culture and right. the right, right group of people around you. So and I find that, and, and I find typically that person that does knock on your door too much, you pulling them in the thing and say, "Hey, I love this. I love this. Yeah. I love this. This is great." But dude, not everything that comes into your mind's got to come to my office. <laughs> exactly. We've all had those guys too. I was actually that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, how can we learn more about and it's more and everything that you guys are up to, and maybe reach out to you specifically? Yeah, listen, uh, we are uh, pretty much putting out a certain type of release every couple of days in terms of what we're doing, trying to keep the market apprised. Mm -hmm. The deal that created and more closed about 10 days ago. Yep. So a lot more to come. Uh, we're going to be having some, some, you know, interesting public events that will be held at uh, NYU conference at the Alice conference. So stay tuned right. for those. Yep. Um, and obviously, you know, our new and improved and more website is a great place to learn more about us. Um, and you know, anybody can feel to reach out to me directly if they like, I can pass along the information to you guys and yep. talk through this anytime. Great. Phil, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it, man. Thanks guys. A lot of fun. Have a good pleasure. one. Take care. You too. Absolute pleasure. Bye-bye. So that was pretty, that was pretty cool, Anthony. And what I really liked was that he's underscoring our belief that the digital nomad is here to stay and will become a more essential part of the workplace culture in the future. Yeah, and he's a very unique individual yeah. because very few people that come from his background in finance understand the operation and understand the empathy that goes into the operation mm -hmm. and to the employees. And to be able to take that very professional, uh, you know, demeanor and that incredibly creative financial mind and then really be able to relate to their hotels mm -hmm. uh, is, I haven't seen it very often. Yeah, it's great. Great collection of brands. Great company. Love this partnership with the core that'll really help them turbocharge. Really interesting how they're going to be able to tap into all of the resources, not just on the consumer side, but on that sales side to get people to buy these properties as well and develop them on their own. Very, very interesting plan. Like how they're teaming up. Uh, Dr. Professor Suzanne said it kind of reminds her of uh, the Kimpton thing with IHG, how they're kind of part of the company, but kind of a little bit over here as well kind of separate, right? So they can maintain their, their own oh, identity. Yes, sir. All right. So about maintaining your own identity. Well, I know you all like to identify as podcast listeners, sometimes not viewers. Well, check us out on Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Google Play, wherever you get your podcasts. Well, we are there. Remember, listennotes.com says we're the we're in the top one half of 1% 1 in an all audio podcast on earth. You definitely want to get into that. If you want to follow us, he's at Anthony Hotels. I'm at Traveling Glenn. So if I go up on one of those Virgin Galactic uh, whatever yeah. spaceships and I do a podcast from there, do mm -hmm. I have the number one podcast out of Earth? You know, out of, yeah, out of space? that's right. You will the planet in or <laughs> so. All right, that's all right. All right, I, 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 I screw that it. up. Uh, get me out of here. All right, we're getting out of here now. Remember, tomorrow night, Friday night audit, five p.m. with me and co-host uh, Craig Sullivan over there. Lots of laughs. Even producer Dave likes to show up and have a good time. Next week, we're live on Monday live on monday and then i'm going to be hey, off for the rest i of the have week. a question yeah where are we going to be live on monday i meant the show's live i don't think we're not going to be oh. in a specific location oh okay. tuesday through thursday and then the following monday 
I'm going to the, I'm going to take some. No, I know you're going to fish, but uh, I, I thought like we're going to live. Like I have to show up, and I didn't put it in my calendar. Oh, no, no, because we know we never do, we never do that. I never do that. Where you guys tell me never. to block nope. off, nope. and I and I say, oh shit, I can't do it. Right, sightline hospitality. Kirk Peterson is going to be here on Monday. Thank you, Suzanne. Really appreciate that. Then we'll have some best of shows. And if you're going to be in Vegas next week, let's hang out. Let's pregame. Let's have some fun. I hope to uh, like bring together some definitely hotel people and stuff like that. So it should be a whole lot of fun. All right, everybody. Remember, you've got one life, so blaze on and be kind to yourself. See you all next week.